Take two. All right, guys, what is going on? It's David here, and I want to welcome you guys to episode one of the Create As Prescribed podcast. This is something that I've been working on for the last three to four months. And uh, today's episode, we have Tommy Marquez, former host of the CrossFit Games update show, worked for their media team. And it was just a really good episode, just learning from him and his experience in regards to running an affiliate, to uh, how he refined his craft in regards to writing and journalism for the CrossFit media team, um, and just everything in between. Uh, just learning a little, a little bit more about his background, where he came from, uh, and just tons of little nuggets of wisdom uh, career-wise. And I think it was just an overall just good time. I really enjoyed it, and I really hope that uh, this show uh showcases that it's um showcases that so without wasting any more time let's go ahead and hop into today's episode so i grew up in a town uh just about 45 minutes to an hour south of here, uh, called Salinas, California. It's pretty small, it's kind of known as a farm town, um, surrounded by agricultural fields, but the one kind of benefit of that is uh, growing up there, I was encouraged to basically be a kid that was outside all the time. So my family very much understood the importance of me going outside playing, um, the kind of physical aspect of growing up and, um, and getting to be involved in sports and um, all that. My dad was an athlete. Um, my mom was very supportive of the fact that like, she wanted me to grow up with a better, under, a good basis and understanding of um, the physical side of my development along with, you know, obviously trying to um, develop the mental side and being, and being a, a good student and things like that. But, um, so I grew up playing tons of sports. I grew up basically spending every moment um, that was free, that I wasn't like doing homework and stuff like that, outside all summer long. It was one of those, I, I'm really grateful for it now because I don't feel like kids nowadays get as much of it, but it was one of those situations where like summertime, like if, I, if, if it's daylight, you're outside and you come home when the, like the street lamps turn on, yeah. yeah. So it was this kind of really cool like old school, like go outside, socialize, you know, uh, meet other kids in the in the neighborhood, go play. You kind of had this own kind of um, kind of social experiment, along with like the physical side of playing sports and doing all those things. And that was a huge part of me, kind of carrying that over as I grew up. So in, in high school, I played um, I played football, basketball, and ran track. And then in college, um, went to go try and play basketball. Decided I hated it, and then ended up playing lacrosse. So th there was this basis for experimentation in, ter in terms of trying new things physically, as well as trying to kind of test all my different limits and see what was available to me from that physical side of things. On top of like my parents were being really um, supportive in like my own intellectual growth. Um, neither of my parents finished college. Um, I was one of the first people in my family to go to a four-year university right out of high school um, and then to follow through and get my degree. So my parents were very, so they understood the bigger picture of like, these are the areas of development we want you to, to work on. Um, and were really supportive in doing everything they could to, to push me in that regard. And so along that, those lines, there were a couple of things that I kind of naturally gravitated towards. Um, one was helping people. So in, in college, I eventually switched from kind of this generic pre-med science major towards like a psych bio, clinical psychology focus. Um, the primary reason being I saw that as an avenue to really help people. The other side of that was um, I, I did a communications minor, particularly with some of the media and journalism stuff. Um, growing up, one of my buddies was like always had a camera around, like he loved making home movies and by like just like maybe by os osmosis, all of us kind of fell in love with that too. So like from like fourth grade to like eighth grade, like every weekend we were like making skits and movies and stuff like that and kind of like producing our own, our own little like media, I guess, if you will. Um, and so those, the kind of seeds for those two things, uh, I guess for those three things in terms of, um, you know, creating, creating something from a, a media perspective and kind of being in love with that 
that form of communication. Um, the physical side of things from you know sports and, and spending time outside and physical expression and then wanting to help people. Um, uh, I, I come you know from a, a Mexican American family. Um, my dad grew up in New Mexico. My mom was kind of an army brat and my grandpa was in the military. My dad was in the military. So being like kind of like a minority in a town, it's a farm town where minorities are, are you know, uh, basically like the baseline level worker. Um, and then having, coming from an area of service in the military, those seeds all kind of pointed me towards like wanting to help others and kind of give back a little bit. Having come from a position where I realized that was important um, in order to help others get ahead. And so eventually I kind of found my way into the mental health services at the college, um, worked in a mental health clinic for a few years, kind of focusing on that craft. Um, it's a very, very, very heavy subject to deal with on a daily basis as your, as your, like your work. And so CrossFit and, and training became my physical outlet. So as I was becoming like a, a therapeutic source for many others, CrossFit became my therapeutic outlet, and eventually I kind of found it as a way to help others on a much broader scale. Um, eventually I left my job in mental health services, opened up an affiliate, um, opened up an affiliate in, in my hometown of Salinas, and started running that for a couple of years. Um, through that, um, I, and through that and other at, like, events in the community, I started to bump into people within the community, and the CrossFit community was a fraction of what it was today. So it was very small circles, and so I had the opportunity to meet some people that worked for headquarters, some people who worked for the media team, and just kind of talk shop in that regard, and talk about like what our goals were and things like that. And so eventually, I must have said the right thing to someone along the lines. So in 2011, I got a call from the media team and Rory McKernan asking if I wanted to help out on their video production team for the regional coverage. Um, so it was still a very new sport. Um, they had a ton of people like camera guys, producers, stuff like that. But none of them had any idea what CrossFit was. So I was essentially a field producer helping dictate content for these people who were already knew the kind of technical side of, of being a creative. Um, and at the time, the sport was really growing into this kind of beacon of this is what like the very best can be if you use this training methodology. So it, it was a source of inspiration for a lot of people. And for me, I viewed it as a way to um, help and be a part of something, like whether it be media, that went out to thousands and thousands and thousands of people in this growing community and could be a source of information, uh, information and inspiration for them. So I saw it as this avenue to A, be creative and B, also continue that kind of mission of helping people, but on a broader scale. At the affiliate level, I was able to um, impact people on a micro level, which is super important because you need people like on the front lines kind of helping and um, working with people day to day. But the work on the media team was a much more macro level type uh, kind of platform to influence people and help them. So it was a cool opportunity that I jumped at right away. And the nature of the media team back then was they just needed bodies. They needed people who were passionate, who knew, knew the methodology and knew the sport, and were willing to learn. And I didn't have, a, I didn't have the, the most technical chops at the time. <clears throat> I knew a few things here and there, and I could learn on the fly. Um, and that's kind of where my role fit in. It, I was just kind of a glue person. Like, you need a little bit of this, you need some of that, you need some production assistant, you need someone running a little bit of camera, you need someone helping direct cameras on the floor, you need someone talking to a like helping a producer build a show with the right content and knowing athletes. Having grown up in the sport, uh, playing sports and following sports and being an avid sports fan, I nerded out on all the athletes and like learned basically everyone's name, their history, and sort of by de facto became an expert in that regard. Um, and other people began to look at me for that. So eventually I got brought on um, full-time at CrossFit headquarters and their media team to help support their growing studio efforts. So um, weekly studio shows and a, a consistent media output covering the sport. And I started out as a production assistant and helping run the studio. On top of that, they needed help writing 
essentially writing shows and stuff like that and putting together content. And since I was studying all the athletes and everything like that, I kind of built myself a niche of being able to pick out storylines, become an, a, an athlete expert, and helping our on-camera personalities at the time, Pat Sherwood, Ray McKernan, Miranda, Miranda, then Old Roy, now Alcaraz, helping them kind of identify storylines. From there, that eventually evolved into me helping produce the shows a little bit more in depth as associate producer. And from there, one of, one of my good buddies, and he was our producer for the update show for a long, for, for the CrossFit Games update show, which that, uh, our studio effort be, became known as, um, eventually one day I was like, listen, like a lot of people know who you are because I've been in the community a long time. I've been involved at, at the affiliate level. I've been out working with people on the media team for four or five years now. Um, why don't you get in front of the camera and start presenting this? Um, as our kind of like athlete expert. And I pitched a few show ideas, um, one being a leaderboard segment kind of going in depth in terms of some of the numbers behind the sport um, and some predictive stats. And I hadn't really thought about that um, doing on-camera work, but it seemed like a fun opportunity and it kind of brought me back to like our skits when I was younger and like having control over that and kind of being creative and, and really just kind of be myself. And so I had the opportunity to build this leaderboard show as my first segment, and I had almost complete control over it. Um, so the opportunity to, like, to be a creative in that space with my own thing that I could take ownership over um, presented itself, and it was an awesome opportunity, and I was super grateful for that. So I really, really tried to focus on practicing and becoming as good as that as possible. Um, I knew I could put the content together, but now I had to be a good on-camera person as well. Um, and try and be as good as delivering that information so that people can glean something from it. Um, and that just kind of snowballed to me being one of, becoming one of the main on-camera um, analysts for the media team. So from, we started doing you know, weekly shows, news style sports shows, covering the sport. I got to interview athletes at the top of the sport from all over the world. We got to travel all over the place, go to the CrossFit Games, get to be on network television, um, and really kind of showcase the sport to a community that had gone from 26,000 registered athletes when I started to just over 420,000 athletes by last year. So it was this massive exponential growth that I got to be a part of, and I got to kind of grow in that process as well and work on, on myself and being able to provide something of value from the creative side to this community as well. And it was kind of this really, really cool um, journey that I'm grateful for that ultimately ended up with me being um, um, a co-producer for the Update Show throughout the year, writing a, a consistent like, journalist from a written perspective, writing anywhere from 20 to 30 articles covering the sport a week, so written publications as well. Um, producing my own segment um, inside the leaderboard, which ran basically weekly every, every week of the season, as well as getting to help produce interviews and, and really kind of be a driver of our studio content along with our team that we kind of got to build from the inside out. No, you're good. Yep. <laughs> and, and so along that, along that process, we had this awesome team that got built together that all of us kind of one by one got picked into. And the last three years in particular, we've been, able, we've been able to basically check off all the boxes that we wanted from a media team perspective, all with the goal in mind of providing the best possible coverage for this community that was hungry and growing and be kind of a beacon for that community for other people to point at and be like, look, like our, our community, our sport, our methodology like should be taken seriously. We're not just this fad and we're kind of changing the world and helping others through this process. And the sport is one side of that. The everyday fitness methodology in the gym is another side of that. And through our media efforts, we're able to support both as well as you know, become a network, a network television quality studio output um, and all of ourselves develop along with that. So it was kind of this crazy back and forth journey in between. And you know, ended ended up in a pretty cool spot, and um, 
you know, got to see some tremendous personal growth as well as continue to help others, which was the main mission from the start um, in a variety of different formats. Okay. Um, so kind of going back uh, earlier, you were talking about how you went through the process of like, um, you went to school for, you know, um, uh, more psychology based and then also minoring in, in uh, communications. Um, as you were going through this process of like producing this content, developing, you know, all these different segments and stuff like that. What was that like? Did you have to, you, were you taking like classes on that? Like, or were you just like learning a little bit more about that online? What was mm -hmm. that process like? So you mean once I like was on the media team? And everything? Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I, I think I learned best by watching, um, by physically being in the room or physically being in a space where I can see how other people operate and watch it firsthand. I'm not the best when it comes to like just following a script and reading things like that and trying to learn that way. I, I, I think I'm definitely a better visual learner. So when it come, came to the technical side of helping produce, um, I, I start, there was a couple people in our company that were really influential for me. Uh, one of being uh, Joe Novello, who was our coordinating producer, and kind of watched how he operated a little bit on top of um, uh, my good friend who ended up putting me on camera, Charlie Doobie, watching how he kind of went from getting an idea, putting it down on paper, um, format, formatting it into the show, um, what a show format on television looked like, um, and then kind of working from there. Um, and then every time a new person, because as the season progressed from um, the open to the games, more there were more people that got involved. So we had multiple TV trucks at the games, so I got to see formats from a bunch of different producers. And when I was just a production assistant, I tried to watch and observe as much as possible. Watch how they put a format together, watch how they took an idea and what were their steps in kind of putting that down on paper. And ultimately, what did that idea end up looking like at every step along the way between um, just you know, kind of talking about it in, a, in an open room format with a bunch of people around to the finished product, what it looks like, delivered uh, and kind of taking down notes along those along the path um, and so it was kind of very a very informal thing um, I would take notes have stuff kind of build my own like Google Docs and stuff like that and um, slowly kind of figure out what things I thought worked best for me because um, everybody kind of has their own different style in regards to on-camera stuff I wa that was probably the most visually oriented in terms of me learning and kind of developing. I watched other people how they how they went about it and I practiced a ton in front of the in front of the mirror in, in terms of um, writing a lot. So my my like my physical writing and actually getting to say things out loud was a huge developmental process for me because I realized that I write much different than I naturally think off the cuff. So when, I, when I'm putting words onto paper, I'll read that back as if it's a script and my mind and, and my hand, like just there's something slightly different. For the most part, it's, it's, they've kind of melded together along the way, but I realized that um, I have kind of two distinct voices in my head, I guess, and that sounds kind of funny, but um, I, I had to iron that process out a, a couple of times, especially when I was first on camera. I realized that writing these scripts down when I would present it, it didn't sound like me anymore. Um, and my voice sounds different on paper than it does when I'm presenting it. And so over like, like hundreds and thousands of repetitions behind the scenes and like, like whether it be in my, like in my bedroom, looking at the mirror, like delivering, looking at my mannerisms, and then also turning around and looking at, okay, what are, what are, what are those same things applied in other people? So there are a couple of guys, Roy McKernan and Pat Sherwood, who I watched and how they presented on camera um, and tried to pick some things that I thought they did really, really well and then tried to emulate that. And obviously they have a very different style and presentation, but that's if those fundamental things that they do well and kind of build off of that, then I can kind of create my own style while still having like this kind of baseline level of presentation that I want, that I admire in them. So that was kind of my process there and then um, from the written perspective, as I started to develop that, 
Um, it was honestly just writing, 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 and having a copy editor that I trusted. Um, so going to someone that I'm like, hey, I want you to just tear me, tear this down. I want you to like rip me to shreds and, and be as critical as possible. And I think that was something that happened every step of the way with, with uh, helping produce um, and learning to put a show together from that side and then also presenting. Having people that I could trust be critical, but be critical in a way that's going to be beneficial for me. So those, those all allowed me to take criticism and um, look at myself critically and without ego being involved and then eventually kind of learn from that along the way as well. Okay. With that, like going through that process, um, was there any like points during that process of like learning and just kind of growing into eventually what you would be doing now? Were there any through like this like phases where it's just like, hey, like I'm not sure if I should be doing this anymore. Or like, hey, like, like I don't think I can cut it or like or mm -hmm. just kind of just like like feelings of like regret or anything mm -hmm. like that? Um, there were definitely some moments of self-doubt. Um, there was, I like very quickly early on, learned early on that like maybe like editing wasn't my thing. And so I wanted to focus on the, on producing and being like a content creator and like, um, idea development. And there were a couple times when they kind of just like cut me loose, like, Hey, put this show together. And as I'm like, going through it, I'm like, all right, like no help whatsoever. And I put like a show together and this is what we're kind of being open to criticism became critical. Um, I handed it over and it was just a mess. It was like, I had all these different ideas that I wanted to put in, but I had no structure and, and, and they took it from there, and when I saw the finished product of what the show was, and I realized that it was nothing like I had envisioned, um, seeing something that you thought you would put together clearly, and seeing it just completely morphed into something else, and it wasn't bad, it was actually way better than anything I could have put together at the time, but realizing that I was so far, there was a, such a huge disconnect between what I wanted to put together and what ended up coming, and what was reasonable for them to put together, was kind of like this moment of like, oh man, like I'm, I'm not as far along as I thought and like I need to like really either like figure this out or like, you know, and you go through the, the natural progression of, of wondering like, you know, am I good enough? You know, is this something can, that I can become good enough? Um, and then is this something I want to continue to pursue? That I never really had much problem with. I knew I wanted to continue to pursue it, but there were definitely those moments of self-doubt. And that, but the, as I mentioned earlier, having people that were critical of you that you trusted was huge in that because ultimately once I went through the kind of cycle of, of self doubt and then eventually reassuring myself that I wanted to do that, being able to have those people that you can approach and talk to about it openly was huge. And I was very fortunate. Not everyone has that. There are people out there on their own trying to figure out by themselves that are just kind of their own sounding board, their own, like, like, um, their own critic. And they have to do that by themselves. I didn't have that process. I can't pretend like I didn't have a ton of help along the way. Um, so that, from that side of things, that was a, a, a huge, a huge kind of moment for me. On camera wise, there was the first time I got to be on camera at the games. There was, we had uh, a setup that was pretty cool. It was like day at the games, almost like NFL or any other like. Um, pre-show or, or setup you would see at, at a live venue. I felt very comfortable at the desk with other people. I felt like when I had a host, other analysts, people to bounce ideas and talk regard. And I thought, hey, I think I'm ready to go on like ESPN when we're like we had because we did have coverage on ESPN, and I was I was kind of on the B team in terms of like analysts go. So I didn't get to be on the show that was const constantly on ESPN. And the, uh, our, our coordinating producer came up to me and goes, hey, you've been doing a really good job. How would you like to be on the ESPN show? And I was like, oh, great, sure, I'd love to be at the desk. He's like, it's not the desk. I'm like, what do you mean? We had a touch screen kind of like Telestrator that had all these cool bells and whistles that you could, you could analyze stuff. And he goes, well, how would you like to go up on the Telestrator? And I'd done it before. 
I'm like, oh, this is an awesome opportunity. And thankfully, we did a dry run. And just to make sure that, like a technical run to make sure that the Telestrator was working, and I absolutely bombed. I couldn't talk. I'm, I'm, I, started, I forgot what I was saying like three or four times, and I, and I pressed the wrong buttons, all the wrong things came up, and my producer gets in my ear and he goes, hey man, like, I know you're really nervous, like, I, and I know like, that was awful. Like, I, like, that was the worst segment you've done <laughs> since, since, we've, since you started working for us. And I was like, okay, I'm aware of that. And he goes, There's, there, you know, this is like, we have to be good for this segment. If you can't do it, that's totally okay. Like, and he didn't say it like, you know, you're not good enough, you can't do this. He gave me the option. He said, if you can't do it, that's fine. It's, there's no, no skin off your back. This is an opportunity. You know, if, if it's not in the cards at this moment, if, you know, if it's something we need to continue to work on to get you there, that's fine. I just want you to know there's no shame in pulling the plug on this because this is an added piece. It's not, you know, a core essential thing to the segment that we're doing. Um, it would be a really cool add additional thing, but, you know, we don't need it. And I had to take a second back, like a step back and was like, you know, maybe I can't do this. Maybe I'm not ready for this. Um, and I was like, give me a couple minutes. And he's like, that's fine. Take your time. You know, just let me know by this time if you're going to be able to do it. Walk through it in my head. I had, pe I had called a couple of my buddies, Rory and, and Pat, and talked to them a little bit about it. They kind of like pumped me up and talked me through it. And again, I had people that could critique me that I could lean into. Um, but that I trusted and eventually we worked through it and I was like, you know what? I think I can do it. Like I got the bad one out of the way. Um, I kind of got through that self doubt and was able to do the segment and I thought I did a, a good job and it, my, my colleagues noticed and even in their toss to me on the segment did, did things to pump me up. So their toss to me was like super positive in terms of like describing who I was because this was my first introduction on, on, national television and so you know Rory gave me like the nicest toss ever and it made me feel good and so I had other people to support me in that regard and I ended up doing the segment great and it worked out really well and my producer got in my ear and was like I'm not gonna lie like you had me nervous in that first one I thought I thought we we're heading towards you know a bomb like a bomb I, like I was ready to switch the camera back and call it te technical difficulties but you did it you did it great uh, and that was one of those moments where I realized my, like, my personal journey in this is, isn't just about me. You know, like, I'm going to mess up. I'm going to do things bad. I'm going to have the moments of self-doubt. But just as I want to help others, I have to seek help myself. And I have to be open to help myself um, if, if it really is about that like, community aspect that I, that I want to preach. And it is. And so I was very grateful for one of those moments. And I think that was as crucial a point in my development as any. Because from there, I was very open to seeking help, and I became much better about seeking help in that regard and not thinking I had to do it myself, um, which oh, I think a lot of creatives get, get, um, fall into that trap of it's like, I gotta learn this myself, I gotta take this on myself. It's kind of like me against the world type mentality. Um, like I gotta hustle and grind, I gotta be on my hustle and my grind and do that my way, when the reality is like, there's so much awesome opportunity and stuff to be learned through the help of others um, and that was in that moment like became super clear to me and I think that was a kind of a turning point in my career as like an analyst and on camera and like I noticed a difference in how I approach things and it made me much more su successful and better as, um, as, as a co-worker, as a friend, as a lot of other, a lot of other things in my life where you know seeking help and being helpful is, is crucial. That's crazy. Uh, it's like almost like yeah, a turning of a chapter into to something new. Yeah, it was. Uh, it felt like it was like it felt like going from like the amateur ranks to like the pro ranks. Like, and not saying that, that as a way like that like I was a pro at that point. It was like no, I'm like I'm gonna take I'm gonna take all the steps that a professional would take now in order to become that. Um, I'm not just here like just trying to wing it like obviously I'm putting my like all the effort I can but now I need like I need to 
like lean into others and I need to like bring other people in to help me support this and drive this forward because I'm only going to be able to take this so far myself. Um, and that was a, like, that was like made all the difference in the world for me. Now I viewed it like, it was, it's kind of like, I talk about this a lot, is the shift from me to we. Um, and that shift is crucial in any environment where you're basically not on, on an island and you're trying to work with a team. And um, it made me, it, it completely changed my outlook and it made a huge difference in me going forward after that. It's almost like, uh, like, like how before people always say like, oh, like, make it till you make it, make it till you make it. But when you make it till you make it, you're kind of only focused on yourself. And then you get to a point to where you know, you get past that and then now you can actually give back to people because you're not so worried about like validating yourself. Mm -hmm. But it's like, okay, like I'm like, I'm, I'm ready to, to play on the field. Like I, I'm like, I can be, you know, a running back or a receiver. You know, I may mean, lose sometimes, but yeah. I can take a hit now. Yep. I can keep moving forward. Yeah. It was, it's a, uh, it's and I actually said this in a podcast um, last yesterday about an athlete that was competing this past weekend that, um, I saw something very impressive from him in, in terms of him bombing a couple workouts and coming back. Uh, one of my favorite mo like movie scenes um, is from the movie Green Street Hooligans, and it's all you know. I don't know if you've seen it, but yeah. And Elijah Wood gets like clocked for the first time in one of the like street fights, and he like hits the ground, and he's like this like journalist that has never been in a fight before. But he talks about like the moment when you realize you're not made out of glass, and like, and that's like such a, an enlightening moment that like you could take a hit and you're like, the world's still here. And you're like, okay, like, and now you're able to actually stand up and contribute like outwardly and like, you know, really grow from there. And like, that was definitely one of those moments like, hey, like I, I, I could take a hit, you know, like I can bomb and bounce back and I'm gonna do it through the helps of others. And now that's gonna make me so like being in a more of a managerial role, like, like in the future in the last couple of years and like, helping other, like other PAs and stuff, like it allowed me to be better. And like through helping them, I became better too. That wasn't the goal, but our team became better. And that was ultimately the goal. And as a result, the community benefited from that, um, which is like all these dominoes in a row that ultimately led to us like accomplishing our goal on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. You know? So with that, um, and just kind of a, a drug process and stuff like that, and just kind of shifting, uh, like you said, from me to me, has there been any um, like projects or, or shows or segments or anything that you've worked on that you would say that you felt has been like the culmination or um, has just been like uh, a really good, uh, like something you've just been like proud of mm -hmm. uh, as far as like an accomplishment? Yeah. Um, so, maybe a, like a project and I guess maybe a time period that I would say I'm like super proud of um, as, as a team that we accomplished. Every year, probably the most difficult time in terms of like the amount of content we're putting out and the time frame is regionals. So the, the season kind of narrows from basically the open, which is like one workout over five weeks, um, which is a decent amount of content we put out around that. Now we have, it, almost the same amount of content, content, but it compresses to three weeks. And then it compresses to one week for the games. But the games is like a different level just because we have all the technical support. We have trucks through and producers and people all over the place to help. But regionals, it's still essentially our core group. And we have, in the last couple of years, we've had nine regionals over three weekends on six of the continents. Um, around the world. So we're working at different time, frame, time zones and time frames and things like that. And we're essentially working around the clock. And we bring in some extra on-camera talent and a few other um, producers and stuff that have worked with us a ton. But to me, that's like game time for us. Um, I think over the course of three weekends, we do somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 to 125 live hits. Um, we're, you know, live hits covering like recaps in Australia, um, the Middle East, uh, Europe, South America, like eight different states, uh, six different states in the United States, Canada, um, I mean all over. So it's like 
the, the entire world is collectively looking at us and we're like between every heat, between every like live hit of, of competition, we're there. Like from the moment you wake up in the morning till like we sign off and it's at like between four and five in the morning on some days and we're not leaving till you know, eight, 10 at night, sometimes midnight. And it's to me, that's like when we all rally and band together. Like I mentioned, like, you know, over a hundred live hits, we're doing interviews, we're doing like full studio segments, we're doing social media desk segments, like the entire menu of what our studio can do is there and we're using it like constantly. And we have, we basically set up a war room in our, in our office and we're like, we're either there, the, 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 the break room for food or we're like in the studio with a control room. And it's like, it's just humming. It's just one of those things where it just feels like we're just live news 24 seven. And every year we look, I look back at it. I look at everything that we've done, all the different hits, the style, and I look at how we all mesh together. And that's a huge growth point for us. Every time we get done with regionals, I, the last three years, I have felt like this is a team that can do anything. It doesn't matter what the scenario is. It doesn't matter like, you know, where we're broadcasting from. Um, and we're pulling in streams, like I said, from all over the world. That's the one that I look back at with the most pride because it's like, there's no escaping. If you miss a live hit, it's gone. If you mess up something, it's gone. Like you have to be on point the entire time. And regionals are our highest traffic area for any particular time. So, um, because, because everything is being streamed through, through our website, website through our, our streaming platform, platform. Like, like everyone's looking at us. And, I, and it's when people basically, from a competition standpoint, it's when people's, and this sounds kind of corny, when people's dreams become reality. So everyone wants to get to the games. Like the, becoming a games athlete is the, like the goal for everyone in the competition. And that happens at regionals. Sure, they walk out of the games and that like dream takes place, but like it doesn't become a reality until they qualify. So like the, the like the highs, the highest highs of the sport and the lowest lows happen at regionals. So from a storytelling perspective, that's when we have to be on point two. And then from a technical perspective, having all the streams coming in, having multiple desks, having, you know, anywhere from seven to 10 on camera analysts, interviews, everything like that. Like we got to gel and there's no time for anything else. If we mess up, it's got to be in the rear view and you got to keep moving forward. And so that's one of those ones where like you're exhausted by the end. And then you look at back at everything you accomplished over those weeks. And then you look at all the feedback that people are talking about in terms of like what we were able to do, the stories that we were able to tell, the athletes thanking us for the things that we were able to do when really we're just shining a light on them. And you're like, that's what this is about. Like, that's what we were able to do. The community is pumped up. The athletes are pumped up. Everybody's hitting, going back and hitting the gym harder. Like every, uh, our, our studio is basically, we touched every part of our studio in terms of like utilizing it. And like, we gave full effort. And like, you can't really ask for much more than that. Like, like everybody gave full effort. Like everyone is happy. Most people are happy. Not everyone's always happy. There's always someone on YouTube that's pissed off. But, um, but yeah, like, and, and, it, and it required everything out of you. Like, I think that's important. If it didn't require everything from us, like for us to put in full effort, then I don't think it would be as gratifying. Like I, I think it, it like demanding the utmost attention, respect, and effort from us is what ultimately going to make the best product, and it's going to make us the best as as creatives, and it's going to make the best um, like give us the best result in the long run in terms of accomplishing our goal. Um, that's that's really cool. I mean, especially kind of just to. Hearing that, and like just like as an outsider, seeing how much um, like production-wise, you know, the storytelling has grown from. As you look, like I remember when I first started out, I would watch like the old uh, games, you know, episodes and stuff like that on YouTube, and just like seeing how like how everything was played out then, mm -hmm. and then it's like now you look and like you get you like. You have all these people, you have the volunteers, you have you guys that are, you know, full-time uh, media guys and just like everybody coming together. And, you know, again, like you said, like just putting forth 100% effort mm -hmm. to like really make this like a great presentation. And I think 
that has really shown with, um, you know, just everything, like, I mean, I think that's, every time I've talked to somebody that's about, like, the media team and stuff like that, that's always the thing, is that, like, like you guys are just really good at telling stories and, and just being able to put out content. Um, and so with that, um, I guess kind of transitioning now, I'm just kind of looking at, like, you know, we've had this past, all these changes that have mm -hmm. taken place yeah. this past year with, you know, the way the format of the games is taking place. Um, and uh, my question for you then is, what do you, like, in terms of uh, media and how um, coverage will be um, created now going into the future, like, what do you think are, like, how do the changes on the games affect how, like, media coverage will be presented uh, moving forward? Um, I think it's going to be, it's going, to, it's going to be a big change. Like, like, like I can't overstate how much of a difference it's going to be from one year to the next, because prior in the years prior, you essentially had a, a centralized media output effort. Everything came from headquarters and worked out. There were other outside media as well that was involved, and you know we tried to play ball with them as much as possible. But you had a concerted centralized media effort that was like from the top down. And with all the changes, the media team being outsourced, you're not going to get that one like go to source necessarily because, uh, and it's not going to be that direct line from the company, you know, outward. Uh, and that's going to really put the emphasis on, and I, I think. I think it's kind of going to be kind of like this weird free market version of media where there's going to be a lot of opportunity for a lot of people to jump in the space and start creating their own media and who who ends up becoming the primary source is really up for who can put together the best package um, there it's not going to be and, and and what that ends up looking like is going to be very different than what it was in the past i don't think you're going to have one central broadcast from the crossfit games like there was in previous years i think there's going to be a potential of two to three different broadcasts from different companies putting their own flavor on it. And it's going to be up to the community to decide which one they want. Um, you're also going to have a ton of different other people going out on, excuse me, going out on their own. And that's already started to happen. Um, a lot of us who worked at the media team still covering the sport, but in different avenues, whether it be publishing stuff on YouTube, whether trying to put out our own content, whether starting podcasts, vlogs, um, like full production series that, um, that they were kind of used to, but just not in one place. So you have this kind of um, scattering effect of everything else. Um, I, I would, I would kind of call it like a Hydra effect. So like the head of the media team got cut off and now it's just spawning three to four more heads off of that. Um, it, for, as a viewer, it may be difficult to kind of hone that in. Um, as a fan, it was much easier under the old way. But at the same time, I think there lies potential for something much greater. Um, before you had a single track of media that, you know, you know, took it as far as it was, and I think it would have continued to grow and get better. But now with opportunity, there's a lot more influence from outside coming in that could potentially spawn a, an even better idea. Um, and that really uh, remains to be seen. Um, it could be, you know, there's an opportunity for great potential. There's also the opportunity that it could completely crash and burn um, with too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, so I think this year in particular, in 2019, is going to be a big developmental year and everybody kind of feeling out and seeing what the, the best avenues are, um, who's going to take charge and lead that. Um, it's, I'm, I'm going to go on a limb and say it's not going to be the best year financially for a lot of people because it's going to take a financial investment of people putting back into it versus pulling like taking from it um, and withdrawing like it has been in the last year where things were set the investment was paid for and, and now people were kind of um, harvesting off of that so i think that that usually requires that's going to see a lot of people fall by the wayside some people maybe switch and move out of the, out of the game so to speak um, but i think and I've said this before, this new system from a competition standpoint, from a media standpoint, um, really on, on all fronts is going to be lifted up by the community. And then being able to 
um, not only decipher what's most important to them from these efforts, but put their full support behind it too. So um, to give an example, I, a very low barrier to entry for us when, when we shifted was, and, and you know, when we got let go from the media team, was we wanted to continue to provide something of value similar to what we had been before because there was d clearly a demand for it, but we didn't want to decrease in quality. So as tempting as it was just to grab a camera and start like, you know, like, hey guys, I'm in my bedroom, you know, like, what's up? Um, I felt like at that point, all the effort we had put in and time we had put in that like the community deserved more from us. Um, so an easy way for us to do that, to do that without compromising quality was a podcast. It's super easy to, to put out. Um, the format's very easy and from a, um, a monetary investment standpoint, it's much more reasonable to do if you're unemployed. <laughs> Um, so we started, like myself and a few other of my, my coworkers, from, former coworkers from CrossFit, put that out and allows us to work together um, and start to put that out. Now, whether or not that becomes a viable career long term depends on if the community decides that's, that's viable. viable. And, and, and that's fine. Or, and not just that, when I say community, I'm talking sponsors, I'm talking other people in the, in the space that want to put their their support both just from a listing standpoint and from you know a monetary standpoint. And whether or not they do that, we're gonna to continue to make it because we, we know that there's value to it and we want to help. But whether or not that we have to do other find other avenues on top of that is entirely dependent on the community. And that's just one example. You know, another example is two of my friends, Hebrew Cannon and Marcel Sawyers, that produced the Fittest Owner documentaries, excellent filmmakers. I mean they're just fantastic and they're good people. Um, they're trying to put together a road to the game series similar to what they did last year, but they're trying to do it on their own. It's a huge financial investment. I mean, like a six figure financial investment if they want to put it out solely on their own. And for, you know, Hebrew who's got two kids in the family, Marcin's, Marcin who just bought a house, you know, you know, has got trying to support, you know, and work with his wife as well. Like that necessarily isn't in the cards right away. So they're putting out vlogs and they're doing other ways to, to to see what the community's appetite for that is. So if they do see value, they're going to have to get behind it. And eventually that's going to help them uh, continue and then continue to provide more value for the community. So it's really going to take community effort, assuming it's something that they want. If it's not, then it's not. We move on and find something else. Yeah. Um, well, I think all of us are pretty committed to, committed to the greater CrossFit and CrossFit Games community and committed to staying in the space. What that looks like is going to be dependent on what the community decides. And that's equal parts exciting and equal parts terrifying. <laughs> because your, your fate is in the hands of other people. And we wouldn't do it if we weren't invested in them. And we wouldn't do it if we didn't believe in them. And if we like, didn't have, if, they, if we weren't a part of that community. And if you know, we hadn't, from years and years of doing this, you know, had full faith that, you know, that this is something that they want. Um, and, you know, like, like I said, it, may, might, it might take a failure and recrafting, failure and recrafting that natural process, but it's something that we're committed to eventually fleshing out, so. Okay. Um, so with that, kind of with, like, and I think, like, that's always the hard thing is, is just trying to figure out, like, what's next, right? Like, I mm -hmm. kind of went through a similar a similar situation at, at my job where they're like, hey, like in six months you guys are gonna have a job, so you guys better start working for something. Yeah. Now. At least they give you a heads up. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I was on vacation and I get this email and I'm like, okay, like that's interesting. Um, so just kind of going through that process. Um, for you, like do you have any like do you still want to continue to uh, be a some sort of player within the industry of CrossFit? Are you looking at maybe kind of maybe moving outside of the world of CrossFit, maybe go towards more traditional like media, mm -hmm. um, maybe a different like network or something like that and trying to go that route or like, what do you, what yeah. are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'll be honest and say that I've considered all of it. Mm -hmm. um, during this, during this initial month, few months of change, there were some huge moments of self-doubt for me. Um, personally, considering a career change, not necessarily like in terms of what I was doing, but who I was doing it for. Um, 
you know, there's putting together my demo reel and all these other things. Um, you know, I'm like, I'm going to send my dem- demo reel to CBS. Um, they were our broadcast partner and I've made connections through them. And it's, I think it would be doing a disservice to my own personal growth if I didn't at least look at, consider all the options. And I hate saying that. Um, it's weird because I feel like, like I've committed to a pretty selfless cause in terms of like trying to support CrossFit and CrossFit community. But I'd also think that like in order to like reach my potential and continue to do that better, I maybe have to explore avenues outside of that for a little while. So that's definitely been something I've also, you know, contemplated, you know, whether or not that I could do a complete shift like to other companies, like looking in Silicon Valley, the, the, the media, I guess the media world is growing rapidly. And I think it's the appetite for media and the need for media from a corporate standpoint down to the individual is I'm just starting to like, it's exploding. And so I think in order to have a full understanding of what I want to do, I have to open myself up fully to all the possibilities that lie, you know, therein for me. Um, I also have a girlfriend that's about to graduate physical therapy school. And so I have to be mindful of her and her journey and what's going to be best for us in the long term um, as well. So that's that that puts a lot of pressure on me because for the longest time, her being a student, me having a job with the media team, my life was stable. Her life was maybe unstable being a student. And now the script has kind of been flipped and now she's finishing school and I'm just re-entering like the, 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 wor- the workforce from a, like an unemployment perspective, um, which is this you know, crazy 180. So now I'm, I had to take a hard look and I'm still continuing to look, but I've also realized that one of the things that kind of lights, like really invigorates me is working in this space. So I think in some capacity, I'm always going to be involved. Um, I just need to figure out a, what's going to be the most viable path for me to, to be able to take care of like basic necessities and things like that. Like it's just, it's not cheap to live here. I got, you know, I have to pay my bills, make sure, my family's taken care of, um, make sure I take care of the, my loved ones and the people that are around me and make sure that ultimately what I do is going to like, like light a fire in me. And that sounds a little cliche, but I, I found that before when I was working for headquarters. And now that that's gone, it's like, okay, I know what that feels like. So I need to seek that out again because, um, I think that's, that was, a, it was, it, it was a huge benefit for me and others. And I want that to continue. So, um, I'm, I'm writing for, for the Morning Chalk Up, which is a newsletter. I'm kind of their lead in terms of a, in terms of a writer for covering the games. So I get to k- kind of keep that, that edge sharp. Um, I've been doing some projects here and there. There's a bunch of sanction events that I've been working with and talking about um, helping kind of flesh out media plans with. So there's definitely opportunities within the space. It's kind of slow rolling because everyone's a little cautious with this new system. Um, but I've, I've come to terms with that and, and it's brought me a great deal of patience uh, as a result. And I think that's going to be key for me in being patient and not just expecting to jump from I've said that 29, like 2019 is going to be the best exercise in patience for me as a, as a human being. So um, that in itself is, is something that's good, you know? So. Um, if, if in, a, in a blue sky scenario, I, could, I would stay in the space, continue doing the things that I love to do, and that's you know generate media from a written and video perspective, helping cover the sport, helping cover the community too, because it's not just about the sport, and you know getting to put out things, content that the community loves um, and finds inspiring to the point where you know they want to go train, they want to continue on their path to being better. So um, that's. It's what I was doing before, and it may look different, you know, who signs the paycheck or where, how that ends up being viable to support myself and my family may be different, but it, the goal is still the same, I think. Would you ever consider uh, going back into like running an affiliate or? Yeah, but I think the running, running affiliate was also a huge point of personal growth for me because it made me realize like 
what operating a small business is like. And like, I, I mean, it was nonstop. And I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I didn't do the greatest job of doing it at the time. I was a good coach. I thought I was a, I thought I was a good coach. Um, my clients enjoyed it. And we had a, we had a high retention rate for clients. Um, but there's a lot of little things that I could have done better. Um, and being separated from it has allowed me to see that now. Um, if I did go back into the affiliates, like becoming an affiliate, <clears throat> it would have to be, I'd be a lot more picky. Uh, we'll say that. Like it would have to be uh, this, uh, like a much more specific scenario with all these things taken, uh, taken care of and understood ahead of time. I wouldn't just dive into it like I did before. Um, and it's something I'm open to, but like I said, like I've, I've kind of narrowed down in terms of like, this has to be the situation for me to do it. And then, uh, last question uh, for the day. Uh, you got two options. Uh, just finish your workout. You have the choice of either Fit Aid or Choco. Which would you pick? Ooh. <laughs> Depends on the flavor. Golf or uh, Ooh, yeah, that's one of them. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> I'll probably go with. Ooh. Man, you're asking the hard questions. <laughs> uh, I like them both, and they're both great companies, and they're both good people. I probably go with the pomegranate punch. A kill cliff. Okay. Um, I have this kind of like higher hierarchy of things. Yeah. I really like Focus Aid. I really like Party Aid. Like those are my two favorite flavors from them. Um, it probably goes Party Aid, Focus Aid. My two favorite flavors are um, I really like the pomegranate from Kill Cliff, and I really like the r regular like Blood Orange. Okay. Like those two. Like those are in one A, you know. Um, and I've been very fortunate to meet both like both know both the companies and meet people from them and interact with them and they're awesome people so it sounds weird but my allegiance isn't just to one so like <laughs> i like i want them both to succeed so yeah. you know like I'll, I'll support both of them so but that's a good question yeah yeah D probably probably got a punch all right. yeah all right well uh yeah thank you again for uh, taking some time out of your day and, and hopping on this uh yeah. interview and yeah wish you the best with everything that's going on so yeah Appreciate it, and I'm happy to help out as much as possible. All right, guys, so I just want to thank you guys again for taking the time out of your day to check out today's episode. Um, I'm going to make sure that these episodes continue to improve in quality over time, and just hopefully we'll be able to have an array of different guests. Um, and yeah, if you guys have any questions or any comments that you guys would like to find out more about in regards to my progress, um, with the shows or just, I would love to hear you guys' thoughts on today's episodes. So make sure to leave those comments down below. If you guys enjoyed today's episode, please make sure to hit that like and subscribe button because that lets me know I'm creating the kind of content that you guys wanna see. And I'm constantly in this pursuit of creating stuff that you guys actually enjoy to watch or listen to as a CrossFit athlete, weightlifting athlete. And I wanna make stuff that at the end of the day, you guys become better people from. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that from today's episode. Tomorrow or the next episode uh, is going to be super dope. We have Jared Truby, who is the owner or co-founder of Cat and Cloud Coffee. That's also based in Santa Cruz. He's actually one of the former uh, co-founders of Verb Coffee. If you guys have never heard of them, they're a big, pretty big coffee company based here on the West Coast, but he's also an avid CrossFitter. So uh, that episode's really dope because he just shares a lot, again, just a lot of cool, dope nuggets and wisdom of his career and just the overlap between being a CrossFit athlete at well as, as well as being a business owner. So if you guys are in the process of wanting to start your own business, uh, this would be an episode that you guys don't want to miss. Uh, this is also going to be available as a podcast format as well as a video format. So either or if you're listening in your car, if you're at work or something like that, this is going to be an episode again, you don't want to miss. So make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. Guys, that's going to be it for today. I don't want to take any more of your time. Let's go ahead and hop into the comment section and continue this conversation. Again, guys, as always, may your barbells be heavy and your coffee be black. This is David and I catch you guys in the next one. Peace.